Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Juan's World within the Christmas season. And you'll see I have all five candles lit in the Advent wreath and will continue to do so from now until Epiphany. And I want to continue today my theme of unpacking Christmas. And the last time I did this, before Christmas, I talked mostly about the lead up to Christmas, how you've got the four Sundays, which is represented by the four colored candles here. And you go one, and then two, and then three, and then four. You're climbing the hill towards Christmas. And in the midst there, you've got things like St. Nicholas Day, Santa Lucia, the Immaculate Conception. You've got all kinds of stuff leading up. Well, today I want to talk about going back down the hill and how you can go down gracefully. <laughs> so let's start down the hill. Okay, so now I want to continue my discussion of unpacking Christmas. And if you watched my first video on the subject, you'll remember that I think of Christmas as being the top of a hill up here, and that Advent season is climbing up to the top of that hill, Christmas Day at the top of the hill, and then on the other side you go down, as opposed to what a lot of people do, which is they climb very steeply up to the top, which is a cliff, and once they have finished, they fall over the end. And, and they're very disappointed and dejected and all of that kind of thing, and they've spent too much money and, and whatnot. And in many countries, including the United States, the day after Christmas, the 26th of December, is not a holiday. Uh, people expected to go back to work. Well, this year they're very lucky because Christmas was on a Friday and so they typically if they do nine to five weekly jobs then they'll have Saturday and Sunday off and so that's great. Well in, in uh, England the day after Christmas which is technically a Saint's Day, Saint Stephen's Day, is usually called Boxing Day very old tradition because in uh, aristocratic households the servants all had to work on Christmas Day because the the lord and lady of the manor wanted their Christmas dinner and they wanted to invite people and so forth and so the servants had to work the cooks the butlers the maids and so forth but they got the day off afterwards and they usually got what's called a Christmas box which could be a present or could be money and so it was called Boxing Day. Boxing Day has been a, um, a holiday in England forever. And it's usually a day of sporting events, it's usually a lot of football games, and used to be a fox hunting day as well. It doesn't happen much anymore because fox hunting was outlawed. I think it's, I'm not sure what the law is now, but it used to be a, a very big fox hunting day. So, you can slowly descend the hill if you pay attention to what's happening afterwards. 26th is Boxing Day, 27th is my Saint's Day, it's St. Saint, Saint, uh, John's Day, Saint, or San Juan, and I always celebrate it with something special. And then after that, the 28th is Holy Innocent's Day. Holy Innocence is actually today that when I'm recording, um, but of course you'll be seeing this on the 29th. But you can see that there are still things 
to celebrate. Now, a lot of people think, okay, well, there's Christmas, we climb up that cliff and fall off it, and then we go back to work for a week, and then there's New Year's Eve, and we climb that cliff briefly and fall off it. Um, maybe, you know, have a big drunken party. Alcoholics and Anonymous calls New Year's Eve amateur night. Um, people get drunk. Some, in some countries, they dress up in you know, fancy dress or costumes or something like that. Get drunk at midnight and then not back to work the next day. Although in England, until I was in my 20s, I believe, New Year's Day was not a holiday in England. It was in Scotland because New Year's Eve, New Year's Day is called Hogmanay in Scotland. It's bigger than Christmas, or it was at one time. They had New Year's Day off, but in England, people didn't. And a lot of people didn't show up for work on New Year's Day. So eventually they just said, okay, fine, we'll make it a holiday. So there's something like two points or two cliffs or whatever you want to call them in a lot of people's minds like you know Christmas done New Year's done and then the year uh, starts again whereas what I'm advocating and what I do myself is just slowly go down so you think about Boxing Day, San Juan, Holy Innocence there's other things coming up all the way to Epiphany if you pay attention and then after Epiphany, you have a little gap and then Carnival starts <laughs> and Carnival runs all the way to Ash Wednesday. So it's a very long, contoured, complicated season. Now, the part I want to talk about now is the, the part that concerns the stories that we associate with these events. And as I said in my previous video, if you walk around a mall or go in shopping centers and town centers and so forth, you'll see everything all jumbled together. You see all the biblical images, um, the manger, Mary, Joseph, some cattle probably, uh, angels, shepherds, wise men, you know, along with Santa, Rudolph, everything all together. But the biblical story is actually quite linear and quite distinct, and it's divided into two parts. There's the part that Luke gives us, which is the first part up to Christmas, and then there's the part that Matthew gives us, and that's the part after Christmas. So the Christmas story in Luke is really quite elaborate. It involves the genealogy of, Je of Jesus, which I've also talked about before in previous videos. It's got a section relating um, Mary to Elizabeth, who it's claimed was her cousin. And they meet when they're both pregnant, and Elizabeth is uh, pregnant with John the Baptist and Jesus and Mary is, is pregnant with Jesus and there's, that's called the visitation of Mary and then there's the journey to Bethlehem, the manger, the shepherds, all of that, that's Luke. And then at the end of that narrative pretty much there's a little extra section but, but as concerned the nativity Luke says okay you know they they um, went to Bethlehem, Mary gave birth, and then they went home. The end. So we have to move to Matthew to pick up the second part that Luke doesn't mention at all. In, in, the, in the Matthew story, there are these magi, sometimes called kings, but then not really described in Greek as kings. They're more like astrologers, like people f looking at the stars. And you also need to bear in mind that 
until quite recently, that is to say until about the 16th century in the modern era, astrology and astronomy were pretty much the same. So in the time of Jesus, these would have been stargazing people looking up and looking for portents in the sky and they see this giant star in the sky and they decide, okay, we've got to follow this. How many were there? We have no idea. The Bible doesn't say. It just says wise men. But they brought gifts. Um, expensive gifts. Gold. Good present for a baby. Frankincense. Now frankincense you can actually still buy. It, that's, it's like the Frankish incense. And myrrh, which is also an incense, but um, not as easily available these days. So three presents, gold, frankincense, myrrh. And so some people think, okay, so three wise men, three magi, because three presents, one present each. Well, that's a very modern approach. <laughs> you know, they could have been 12 of them or two of them and between them they carried you know lots of gold lots of frankincense lots of myrrh or a little bit of gold a lot of frankincense a little bit of myrrh who knows but they've become entrenched as three and they were given names at some point along the line and and all of that kind of thing so they they travel to Jerusalem because they think well the king of the Jews should be born in Jerusalem um, and they meet Herod and they say where is he and let me just point out here that that in this context Jew is an exact synonym of Judean that is a member of either the tribe of Judah or or belonging to the nation of Judah so you can say king of the Judeans well, at the time, Herod was king of the Judeans. <laughs> and so he was kind of miffed to learn that, that the Magi thought otherwise. Well, after they've had some words with Herod, he sends them on their way and says to them, like, when you find this king, then uh, come back and tell me so that I can come and worship him. Ho, ho, ho. And so they go on to Bethlehem and of course they find the baby Jesus with Mary and Joseph and they give him their presents and then they get warned in a dream by an angel not to go back to Jerusalem and so they depart and go home a different way. So, but Herod is really upset and he decides that the best way to take care of the situation is to kill all the young male children in, in Bethlehem. And that is the, um, the situation that is commemorated on this day, Holy Innocence Day, uh, when he supposedly slaughtered all the young males. But, Mary and Joseph were also warned before this happened and so escaped down into Egypt and then didn't return until everything was pretty much safe. So th there's another case, remember with the genealogies of, of Matthew and Luke, the genealogies don't agree. What happened after the birth of Jesus is also quite different in Luke and in Matthew. Luke, he just the fa the royal, the um, the Holy Family just toddle on back to Galilee, and in Matthew they go to Egypt and they stay there a long time, and then and then return. Now, of course, if you watched a lot of my videos, you know that I don't find any of this particularly historically convincing. Uh, how does a carpenter from Galilee and his wife and his newborn baby just decide okay we'll go to Egypt 
it's not as if they had you know friends and relatives there they could say oh you know can, we, can you put us up for a couple of years um, they had no work there they had no connections there and relationships between uh, the province of Judah and Egypt were not particularly good they were all parts of the Roman Empire at the time so there were possibilities for for travel between the two but they but they'd been historically at loggerheads for centuries now the reason that Matthew gives us this account of the flight to Egypt is because it parallels the the Hebrew Bible story of um, Joseph going down to Egypt and then being followed by his brothers and his father and then ultimately being enslaved in Egypt and finally after some unspecified time Moses leads them back out and they and they return and settle in what was at that time Canaan so Matthew is is building this symmetry you know, just as the um, people of old went down to Egypt and came back so Jesus went down to Egypt and came back the, the Messiah kind of acts as a, a small microcosm of the whole people now there are several problems and I really don't want to go into them too deeply but one of them is that archaeology does not support at all the historical accuracy of any people uh, who can be called Hebrew or Israelite ever being slaves in Egypt and the return to Canaan is actually very very well documented in the archaeological record at this point when I say return I mean the, the the point at which the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah became nations the archaeology of that period is very well documented and there is no evidence of a conquest under Joshua there's no there's no evidence of, of a single uh, migration of Semitic people into the region it happens slowly over time so well that's you know but but the thing is that Matthew would have accepted the idea of the Egyptian slavery and the Passover and and Moses wandering in the desert and Joshua and so forth and so he wanted to have the story of Jesus mirror that pattern and that's something you see shot through all of the Gospels they will say Jesus did this and then it will be followed by and so he fulfilled the prophecy that is that the, the Gospels really want to link the Hebrew prophets with not just the birth but the, the life and death of Jesus and Matthew is perhaps one of the strongest of all in that regard one point that I do need to raise though is that the chronology of the arrival of the Magi and the slaughter of the young uh, male children is out of order in the modern um, Christmas season the Holy Innocence Day is the 28th of December and Epiphany the day that the Magi arrived the 6th of January so it's kind of topsy-turvy you've got the slaughter of the innocents happening over a week before the Magi arrived it can't be that way around it, it, it happens that way for all kinds of historic reasons uh, not least being that, that the early fa church fathers wanted to have the commemoration of the Holy, Sin um, the Holy Innocents within the framework of the of Christmas tide uh, you know if, if you had Epiphany Magi arrive go back home and then you have Holy Innocence you know a week or two later 
then you're starting to tie or confuse things with carnival, with, um, with Lent. So you, you don't want to have Christmas and Lent linked together. You, so so they, they put Holy Innocence, tucked it in just right behind Christmas where it doesn't really belong. And that tells you something very important about the way church festivals are organized. They're organized for convenience. <laughs> They're organized for human convenience, the convenience of the church. They're not organized in, in relation to anything historically verifiable or not. But you can still slowly descend that hill the way I do. So like today I will play the Coventry Carol which uh, um, is the lament of the death of the Holy Innocents. You probably know it. It's Lule, Lule, the little tiny child. That one. You know, that's, that's for today. There, there are others as well, less well known. And there are still some other, other festivals. New Year's Day is actually one week after Christmas and is in the, in the Christian tradition uh, called the circumcision of, of Jesus because um, children are circumcised a, a, a week after they're born. And then into the Epiphany season and you've got two things going on there which I'll talk about next week. One of them is January 5th which is the twelfth day of Christmas. If you do your counting 25, 26, 27, 28, you do all your counting 12 Twelfth day of Christmas is January 5th. So that's called Twelfth Night. And then Epiphany is when the Magi arrives. That's January 6th. Um, generally speaking, in, um, in Europe, the, the two have been dovetailed. Um, sometimes people even talk about Epiphany as Twelfth Night, even though it's not. Um, but there are special foods which some people have on Twelfth Night, some people have on Epiphany, and I will talk about all of that because I'm going to be making some marzipan to go on my Twelfth Cake, and I will talk about making marzipan, making royal icing, decorating the cake, all of that kind of stuff. And that's uh, after New Year. So instead of having these two cliffs that you fall off, every year, the Christmas cliff and the New Year's cliff, I find it just so much more reassuring, comforting, enjoyable to climb the hill to Christmas and then slowly descend with New Year's in there but also Twelfth Night and Epiphany and then trail off until very shortly afterwards you're in the carnival season. In fact, in many places, including in Argentina, Carnival starts January 7th, like Epiphany's over, psh, Carnival starts. Same in, um, in Italy. Um, those are the two countries where I've lived where that, uh, that's been true. Um, and, then you, and then you, so then you're gliding back up the hill towards Easter. And so, as I said in my very first um, documentation of unpacking, the Christian year is divided in two halves. There's the really holy part, which is Christmas, starting in Advent, going all the way through to Epiphany, and then Easter, starting in Lent on Ash Wednesday, going up to Easter, and then down towards Pentecost. So you've got, you've got these two high points, Christmas and Easter, stretching from the first Sunday in Advent all the way to Pentecost Sunday. And that's half a year. And then the second part of the year from Pentecost back to Advent is called the Meadow Period because green is the color that is dominant in churches. Green, like growing your meadow. Like you've, you've heard all the good messages, the message of Christmas, the message of Easter, and now you have to put them to work in your own spirit. Well, I hope this has been informative. 
Uh, on Friday, I'm going to give you my New Year's recipes. I'm going to give you two that I always make every New Year's. And meanwhile, please, please, please tell your friends. Please like, please subscribe. And I'll see you for New Year's cooking on Friday.